Okay, here we are. Today I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence. Great. Um, I like this one. I think it's really interesting. And uh, it comes at a good time. It's quite late in the course now. We're nearly finished. You know most of what I'm going to teach you. And that means I can talk to you at a more sophisticated level now, I hope. I can talk to you basically the way I would talk to my colleagues at work or something. So we can do this at a higher level, which will be fun, I hope. Um, there are some other things that come with that, though. I, I now feel free to editorialise a bit more about what I'm saying, to inject some more of my own opinion about things, because I'm also assuming that you're intelligent enough to know when that's what I'm doing and to evaluate it accordingly, just as I was trying to encourage you to do with uh, inventing on principle. So some of the things I say, it will be the usual stuff, fairly solid lecture stuff that you can, you can rely on. Uh, other things, it will be me talking about opinions about a subject that is clearly not done yet. We don't know how to make intelligent machines, or if we necessarily can. Uh, so bear that in mind and realise you, you need to be clever in this one. Right, so what's artificial intelligence? Well, it's that. It's this wonderful, big, complex field of enormous philosophical importance and uh, that may turn out to have a big impact on the world. Those of you who remember the Back to the Future thing that I did, and you're thinking about, you know, what's the big thing that's going to happen in the next 30 years when we're doing this again in 2045? AI might be one of them. Uh, you should definitely think about that. It's a weird subject. It's had a lot of false dawns. It's actually been a very disappointing subject. You know, for a long time, people thought they would be able to do great things with intelligent machines. Broadly speaking, nobody did. It was all rubbish. But things have gotten interesting of late, and I think there's the possibility that stuff might happen now. It could be another false dawn. We've had this before. We've had moments where people thought the big AI breakthrough is coming, and it didn't. But this is an interesting time, so you should think about this stuff. So I'm just putting that in so that if it does happen, they'll know that I was one of their supporters right from the start. I think they should have rights and everything. Uh, so the downside is, although AI is a fascinating field, um, the so-called AI that's in computer games is basically simple-minded rubbish, okay? Uh, and it's nothing like the real problem. And that bores me. So I'm going to spend some of this lecture talking about the real problem, but I will spend some of it talking about the stuff that you do in games for pragmatic reasons. So let's start with the good stuff. Real AI, or uh, strong AI, as you, you sometimes hear it being called. So the origins of AI as a subject go back to 1950. And the paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, written by Alan Turing. So how many of you know who Turing is? Everybody good? Is that because you study him? Uh, do you do the Turing machines and things? You got all that, yeah? Not everyone, but most of you seem to. And I guess the rest of you, he's just been absorbed into popular culture enough now that everyone knows who he is. It's almost like a general knowledge thing now to know who Turing was. That was not the case when I was a student. Maybe it wasn't even the case 10 years ago, uh, but it, it seems to be now. So I'm going to suggest to you very strongly that you actually read that paper. Okay? How many of you have ever read a scientific paper? Okay, so that's a handful. That's a, actually not a bad account. There's maybe a third of you out of this, you know, 30-ish people. Uh, I'll pretend it's 30 for the recording. Um, who are here? So that's pretty good. Uh, when I was a student, it, I found that it wasn't really encouraged to read papers, but it should be, right? That's where the real stuff is. I, I don't want to put you off anything else that you're uh, being you know, introduced to, but if you look at things like textbooks or even lectures, um, they're not quite the real thing, right? They're diluted, simplified versions of the real thing, put into nice little regularly sized boxes, of chunks of examinable material, and okay, that stuff has its place, and it's a stage you need to go through. But see, the real stuff, it's in the scientific papers, the essays, the articles, and occasionally the books written by the serious people. And they're great. These people, they are really clever. And you read their stuff, and you, you realize that. It's much better than what you find in textbooks, in my opinion. In order to help you doing that, 
Uh, if you just go online and search for computing machinery and intelligence, you'll find a couple of versions of it. You can find actually like a PDF scan of the original paper as it was published in the old fashioned typewriter uh, print in 1950, but it's not got OCR on it. So you can't text search it because it's just, it's just a series of pictures. There are some versions that have been OCR'd, but they're full of mistakes, which annoyed the hell out of me. So last year, I spent a weekend taking the original scan and typing it in correctly, fixing all the mistakes, formatting it properly, adding notes, and producing what I think is a good version of the paper. So here it is. So originally published in the journal Mind back in uh, 1950. And I've just copied it all out and cleaned it up and put a couple of kind of my own annotations and clarifications on it. Um, I've done some things like that as well. Okay, so there it is. Now, as you can see from the sidebar, it's 26 pages. Okay, so it's not, you know, it's not a short read. But hey, look, it's 26 pages, right? You can't all read. You read books, right? Books have got hundreds of pages in them. If you're reading some crappy novel, what's that, like about 60 pages an hour or something? This is harder to read than a novel because it's better than a novel. Um, so it involves a little bit more effort. But just sit down, spend an hour and read this, okay? It's really good. Uh, you'll you'll realise that it's good, I hope. And if you don't quite, you'll come back to it in a year or two if you remember. It'll still be here, hopefully. And uh, you can try it again. One of the interesting things about it is you know, you know, the, the words like genius even mean anything nowadays. In some ways they don't, but if they do, if we're going to go around calling people geniuses, Alan Turing is one of the people you would call a genius. And, and this, is, this is how you get to experience what it's like to be one, right? Read his works, because this is, this is why we know how to read and write. We don't learn to read and write so we can like, read, you know, John and Jane stories about rescuing princesses or something. It's so you can actually engage with the works of the really clever and interesting people that have existed. Because I hate to break it to you, lovely as Iceland is, and uh, great as an intellectual ferment uh, Iceland University is, they're not all here. You're not just going to bump into them all naturally. It turns out it's a big world and a lot of the clever people are not in Iceland. What's worse, many of them are dead. But it doesn't matter, because if you read their stuff, it's like you're having an admittedly one-sided conversation with them. But it's like you get to eat their brain in a kind of non-sinister way, and you get to learn all the clever stuff that's in their heads. Please read this paper. To make it a bit easier for you, I'll sort of explain bits of it to you. The good news is, because it was written in 1950, when the field was young, and because it was aimed at philosophers, it's easy to read. There's nothing hard in it, right? Um, the technical stuff isn't hard because nobody was ready for hard stuff. Uh, so it's not hard. Uh, so it begins with the famous question, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? Also, uh, you probably know that Turing was portrayed by the actor Benadryl Cumberbum in, uh, in the imitation game last year. How many of you have seen that film? Yeah. Give me a general consensus. Is that a good film or a... Yeah, okay. So it's okay, but I was poisoned by knowing a little bit too much about him. So it kind of put me off. That, look, Hollywood, right? Hollywood always simplifies and compresses, and you know that. But some of the distortions were a bit too much for me. Among other things, I think he, they got his personality completely wrong. That's not what he was like. You know, they portray him as this kind of Hollywood idea of a genius which is a back projection of our modern ideas about what autistic people are. It's always the same. We just back project modern ideas and pretend that that's what geniuses used to be like. It wasn't like that. Geniuses are much more interesting than that. They're rich, clever people. They're not bloody cartoon characters. I mean, he's a good actor, but you know, the script was very simplified. Also, the script had like, a lot of factual distortions and simplifications some of which are obvious, even if you don't know the facts, you can realize it's like, there's no way that would have happened. Those things didn't happen. Um, they also get some of the details wrong, like the description of the universal machine is wrong. You know, they have Keira Knightley saying, oh, you're planning to make this computer that can do anything. And it's like, no, the whole point of his original 1936 paper about computation, as you hopefully know, is that there are some things that computers can't do. 
That's what he's famous for. He's famous for things like the halting problem, the limits of computation. His universal machine was universal in the sense that it could do anything that a computer could do. In fact, it could do anything that a mathematician could do, sort of. But that's not everything, it turns out. And that was completely lost in the film. There's a better film about Turing, uh, with Derek Jacobi in it, that uh, based on a play that was done in 1986, and it was filmed in 1996, called Breaking the Code. And it's on YouTube. You can just go and watch it. So it's adapted from a play. So, you know, it's a bit boring people talking in rooms type stuff. There aren't any chase sequences in it. But it's good boring people talking in rooms stuff. And there are some bits in it where he talks about his work and what I think is a good, faithful representation of what he really did. So I think it's very interesting. It's half about that, and it's half about his personal life, you know, the thing that he was gay and that caused problems for him and stuff. So some of it's about that, which I personally don't care about, but it was, it was a fact of his life. I care about the work, and there is some stuff in this film about the work. So it's good. And, and Jacoby's a great actor as well. Okay. So you all know what the imitation game is. That's in that paper, the 1950 paper, the imitation game is the thing that Turing proposed as a way of uh, trying to define what machine intelligence might be. It's what we now call the Turing test. Of course, he didn't call it the Turing test because these great people are not monstrous egotists, just like Gordon Moore didn't call it Moore's Law. You know, they get named afterwards. So when you go to the original source, things aren't called what you think they'll be called. So it's called the imitation game. And I'm guessing you'll know it's this idea of you kind of work out whether the machine is intelligent by saying, could it engage in a kind of teletype conversation and convince a human that it was a human? And the reason you do it over a teletype, of course, is so that the fact that the machine is not made of flesh doesn't count against it. You know, it's to try and take out the things that don't matter. So it's just a series of keystrokes coming along a chat terminal and you talk to it for a while and you decide, you sound like a human or you don't sound like a human. So that's the, the Turing test. There's a lot wrong with the Turing test, okay? Um, among the things that are wrong with it is it's implicitly saying that intelligence is being like a human being. Oh, really? You don't think that's maybe a bit arrogant? You don't think there may be other modes of intelligence other than the one that we have? Now, Turing knew this, of course. The, he's clever, okay? The paper explains this, but he does say that, well, if you can imitate a human, that would at least, that would be, um, you know, sufficient but not necessary to be intelligent. If you can fake being a human, that's definitely a type of intelligence. Or so we tell ourselves, despite the fact that many human beings seem to be singularly unintelligent, but for some reason we have a convention to pretend otherwise. Uh, so, so it constrains intelligence to the human mould, and it's also subjective. It's just judged by another person. I mean, that's not like a thorough scientific thing. Some people are more persuasible than others. Some people are more gullible than others. So there's a lot wrong with the test, but it's a, but it's a great starting point. Part of what's good about it is it doesn't obsess about mechanism. The idea is that this machine could be any type of machine. It doesn't even initially specify what it should be. And the relevance to us is that it doesn't matter whether it's made out of you know, valves or transistors or silicon chips or some new optical switch that hasn't been invented yet. It doesn't matter what you make it out of. You judge it by its behavior. Now, that itself is an important thing, and that's part of the philosophy. Some people would say, no, that doesn't count. They would say that if I know that it's just made out of bits of metal and stuff, it can't possibly be intelligent because metal isn't intelligent. And that's like a, a view that some people have. And Turing was saying, no, if it can exhibit the correct behavior, then that counts. Now, in our daily life, when we assume that other people are intelligent, we're doing them a great favor, basically. We're judging their behavior, and we're saying, yeah, you pass as intelligent, regardless of our lack of knowledge as to what people are made of. Like, imagine the other people in this room are actually robots with just skin coverings that have been quite well done. And they are actually just metal and transistors and stuff. Um, does that mean they're suddenly not intelligent? Or does it, no, it means they're just as intelligent as they were yesterday. It's just that now you happen to know that they're robots. So this is part of what he was getting at. 
How many of you know what the Voigtkampf empathy test is? Nobody knows. Okay, that's interesting. Maybe one person half knows. How many of you have seen Blade Runner? About a third of you have seen Blade Runner. So Blade Runner is another classic sci-fi movie in part about AI. I thought more of you would have seen it. You know, Harrison Ford, Chasing Robots. Yeah, it was made in 1982 by Ridley Scott, you know, who also made Alien and things. And it's set in the distant futuristic world of 2019, a future in which, yes, we'll all have flying cars, uh, we'll all live in massive, overly polluted cities, um, and, uh, and we'll all have, well, not all have, but some of us will have extremely impressive, indistinguishable from human robots who go around doing all the dirty jobs that we don't want to do, right? And, uh, but what happens in the story is that some of these robots go rogue. You know, they get notions above their station. They maybe think that they've got rights and freedoms and stuff. Can't have any of that. Um, so some people have to track down the, the rogue robots, but they're hard to tell apart from humans. So in order to tell them apart, you give them a psychological test that's carefully designed to identify the things that the robots aren't good at faking. And that is called the Voigtkamp, in the story, it's called the Voigtkamp empathy test. And it's obviously the Turing test. That's what it is. So here's a version of the Turing test. Describe in single words only the good things that come into your mind about your mother. Your mother? Yeah. Didn't tell you about my mother. Yeah. So there's a lot of good stuff about that. Um, part of it is you'll see how the test has been constructed and why he's failing it. You know, he's overly pedantic. Yeah, wh which desert? You know, what's a, what's a Taurus? Um, he, he seems to lack imagination. And, of course, emotional questions about a mother are going to confuse him, right? Because he doesn't really have one. They have fake implanted mothers um, in their memories. So 
So that's that test being used, and that's very much a, a Turing test. Incidentally, this film, Blade Runner, um, is based on a book by a guy called Philip K. Dick. Do any of you know Philip K. Dick? Some? Okay. Really good science fiction writer who also wrote the stories that Total Recall uh, is based on. Okay, both versions, but the Arnold Schwarzenegger version is the good one, okay? Um, he wrote Total Recall and Minority Report, and actually quite a lot of modern sci-fi. The great Blade Runner, the, the story that Blade Runner is based on has the fantastic title of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Which I think is a very good title. You obviously don't, but never mind. You're wrong. Um, okay, so let's go back to the paper. So in the paper, Turing is coming up with this test, and he's saying... Can a machine think? Well, he's got two problems. One is he needs to define what think is, and he also needs to define what a machine is. And being Turing, he does. Um, so what's a machine? Well, we could come up with a definition, and the first definition he suggests is anything that human engineers can create. That, that, that allows you to build your machine out of anything, to make it with any technique, including techniques we maybe don't know about yet. So that seems like a nice good definition of a machine, isn't it? Is there anything wrong with that as a definition of a machine? Okay, yeah, why can't a machine make a machine? That's true, so you would allow a machine-made machine to be a participant in such a test. That is a good point. But what would be, what would be wrong about saying that anything that human engineers can create is a machine? Yes, they can, in the usual manner. And he says this in the paper, right? The paper's got jokes in it. It's great. Um, so that's the problem. If you use that definition, human engineers can, can, make, uh, can make things by engaging in the mucky business of procreation that, uh, that the breeders do. Um, so you have to rule that out, otherwise the whole thing's a waste of time, right? Yeah, but they, they mm -hmm. make them. Well, uh, uh, well it, depends, it depends what you mean by make. I mean, it is make. You, you, know, you create a thing. I mean, it, it wasn't there, and then after nine months of research in the lab, it's there. <laughs> uh, you know, it all counts. Um, so, you know, uh, but th these are the definitions that are a bit kind of weird. Um, but anyway, the idea is that doing it that way would be cheating, so we have to disallow it. So how do we disallow that without being too vulgar and without maybe leaving a loophole? Because what with other loopholes? Well, I'll tell you how he tries to resolve it. He says, OK, let's say you make all the engineers be of the same sex so that they can't cheat. They can't do it that way. Uh, would that work if you said, OK, the, the, the lab has to be all female? That way they're not going to be able to cheat. Um, does that work? Not if they invent cloning, which he anticipates they might do. He's writing in 1950, and he thinks cloning is a thing that people might be able to do. We didn't have cloning until like 1990, although uh, thinkers and especially science fiction people were thinking about it in the 20s and the 30s. So cloning was actually an idea in the culture. Uh, Aldous Huxley in Brave New World wrote about it. Um, Olaf Stapleton wrote about it. The biologist, uh, uh, GBS Haldane, uh, wrote about cloning in the 30s when people realised what genetics was about. So it wasn't, it's not a complete miracle that Turing was aware of cloning, but it's pretty impressive. So you have to rule out cloning and you have to rule out sex. So he comes up with a new definition that avoids, that avoids cloning and sex. Digital computers. <laughs> okay? Um, he says, that's my definition of a machine. So when I say, can a machine think, I mean, can a digital computer think? It's 1950. Digital computers are brand new. He has to explain what they are. His expected audience are people who are reading the philosophy journal, because there are no computer science journals yet. They're reading the philosophy journal Mind. So these are like university-educated people, professors and stuff, right? He has to tell them what computers are. They don't know. Okay. And he, des he describes them in the paper, and it's great. It's a great description of what computers actually are. A computer is a general purpose machine which can follow a set of precisely defined instructions that you give to them, and it executes those instructions reliably and slavishly. A bit like an office clerk, you know? <laughs> like, you know, just a dumb employee. I mean, not dumb in the, I don't mean that in the worst sense, but, you know, someone who you simply say, here's your inbox, here's your instructions, do the things. I'll see you tomorrow. Or human computers, as these people were still sort of just about known as, going right back to Babbage. Remember in Babbage's day, computer meant a person who does boring clerical work? Right. So these computers have got memory, which is a bit like a notepad, Turing says, 
and they're capable of performing arithmetic and making simple if-then decisions based on the results of their arithmetic. And that's it. And he's right, that's it. That's all computers are. Anything you've ever seen any computer do, and anything you ever will, unless something really strange happens, um, is just that. It's just arithmetic and a notepad and the ability to do if-then. That's, that's what computers are made of. So the other way of uh, sort of formalizing this is to say a computer is a discrete state machine. That is, it's a box that can be in one of a number of states, a finite number of states, and it's in a state, and then something happens to it, like you put some input into it, and something happens, it looks in its book of instructions to decide what to do next, and it moves into some other state. Bingo, computer. Which also means that given the initial state of a machine and all of the input signals, it's theoretically possible to predict all of the future states. So that's a replay system. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't the first person to think of these. Um, and it goes on to say, if you look at the number of states in the machine that we're now using in Manchester, this was the Manchester Mark I, which was the successor to the Manchester Baby that I showed you right back at the start. Remember the Manchester Baby, the one with the cathode ray tube in the middle for its memory? The successor of that slightly grown-up version was called the Manchester Mark I. And he described it as having 2 to the power 165,000 states. Now, what you have to realise is that, that 2 to the power something states is something bits, yes? Because every bit you know, doubles your state space because it's either one thing or another thing. So that means that it's 165,000 bits. 2 to the power 165,000 is a bloody gigantic number, right? but it's only 165,000 bits. It also converts that to a power of 10 because his audience are going to be more used to powers of 10 than powers of 2. little trick for you, if you ever need to do this, if you want to convert 2 to the power n to 10 to the power x, x is n divided by 3.3. .3. That falls out of logarithms and stuff. So if I look at this, 165,000, I need to divide that by 3.3. .3. That's a little bit hard, so I'll just round both down in my head and say 150,000 divided by 3 is about the same, which is 50,000. And that really is how I did it, which turns out to be exact, almost exactly correct. It is 10 to the power 50,000. A gargantuan number representing the extraordinary number of states that this computer could store. But that's only 20k. Yeah? 165,000 bits, 8 bits in a byte. It's 20k. The machine had 20k in it. A sound of thunder. Does that phrase mean anything to any of you? One, one take for sound of thunder. Okay. Um, here's a quote from the paper. This is Turing speculating about stuff and trying to describe the nature of machines and stuff. He says, The displacement of a single electron by a billionth of a centimetre at one moment might make the difference between a man being killed by an avalanche a year later or escaping. Okay? Now, that's an idea that you've maybe heard of, I hope, or a version of that. The idea you might have heard it as called is the butterfly effect. Yeah? Okay, so he was writing about that back then in 1950, despite the fact that the phrase wouldn't be coined until 1970. <laughs> this is what clever people are like. Okay? They're amazing. Um, likewise, that the, the idea is kind of related to chaos theory, which didn't get its name until 1975, although some of the maths was done in 1890 by Poincaré. But all these things are in a paper that's not about those things. And the title, A Sound of Thunder, is the name of a short story by Ray Bradbury, another science fiction writer who also wrote Fahrenheit 451, you maybe have heard of. The anti-censorship book is very good. Censorship is wrong. Um, and uh, Ray Bradbury wrote a story called The Sound of Thunder, which is about a guy who travels back in time to the time of the dinosaurs to visit them. And you go and visit them on these like, special platforms so that you can walk around and not interfere with anything. But he accidentally steps on a butterfly. And then when he goes back to the future, the president is different. The language is different. The world is different. Because he stepped on a butterfly 65 million years ago. That is what the butterfly effect is named after. It was a kind of weird back naming from a science fiction story. Um, you can go here and you can read The Sound of Thunder. It's quite short. I think it's like six pages. It's a short story. And it's the core of all modern time travel stories, including obviously Back to the Future. Right? The idea you go back in time and you do something that fucks it up. Sound of Thunder. 
That's what it is. So he goes on, after doing all these things, uh, Turing tries to give some arguments against AI, objections that a person might have to this idea that these digital computer thingies could ever be intelligent, and he has a list of them. Uh, the first one is the objection from God and the immortal soul. Now, before I get into this, just as an experiment, and I want, the, I want it to be neutral, don't feel you want to get like, picked on, there's going to be any bias here, I just want to know, how many of you believe in God? Okay, a couple of people believe in God. It's interesting. Um, again, just a statistic. So the God argument would be that intelligence is connected to um, a kind of God-given capacity that's in your soul or something like that. Therefore, a machine is never going to have that, so, so machines can't think. That was the argument. Uh, but Turing says, well, I can't, I can't accept that because... Um, first of all, our ideas about souls are culturally dependent. They're different in different places and different times. He says, for example, Muslims believe that women don't have souls. Now, I looked into this, and as far as I can tell, that is not mainstream uh, Muslim thought. I don't know why Turing thought that it was. There appear to be two of fairly obscure uh, Alawite sects in Islam that maybe believe that women don't have souls, but those sects are secretive, so we don't entirely know what they believe Anyway, but there's some evidence that maybe they think that women don't have souls. Um, so he says, well, you know, so therefore, you know, let's not be silly about this. And then he says, and if God is allowed to confer souls on humans, well, why does he stop there? I mean, what about like elephants? You know, elephants are big, clever, interesting creatures. Does he give them souls? Uh, and he says, well, you know, maybe he does. And if, he, and if that's the way it works, then if a machine comes along that's sufficiently complicated, why wouldn't he give that a soul as well? So that was his counter-argument. There are other counter-arguments, of course. The, the counter-argument that there is no God would be one. Uh, you make your own decision about that. Uh, another one is the heads in the sand objection. This is the idea that uh, if machines could think, terrible things would happen. Therefore, they can't. <laughs> Obvious logical error, okay? Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing has got nothing to do with whether it's possible or not. So that objection is just nonsense. But it's one that people say albeit dressed in more kind of subtle language, but that's what they're really saying. Then there's an interesting one, maths, Godel, the limit of logic. I don't know how many of you know about Godel's theorem. You maybe kind of did it a bit with the Turing thing and the halting problem. So the thing is, there are these ideas that, you know, that computers can't compute everything, that maths has got limitations, therefore computers have got limitations, therefore they can't think. But the problem with that is that just because they can't do everything that's conceivable doesn't mean that they can't think. Uh, for example, we don't have any direct evidence that we can do everything that's possible. We might have Godel limitations in ourselves. It doesn't stop us thinking. So it's a subtle one, but I think that objection can be dealt with. So there are a few more of these. I won't go through all of them in complete length, but you know, one of them is that consciousness is magic. Uh, if you believe that, then you believe that. You know, the idea that um, there's just there's just something kind of that cannot be done in a material realm or something. Uh, I don't have a lot of time for it myself. Objections that machines can't do various things, like, you know, they can't tell jokes, um, they can't write good poetry, uh, they can't form, like, emotional bonds with people or stuff like that. But all, those objections tend to be bad because you tr if you think about them, they're just objections that machines can't do this right now. But none of those things rule out the fact that they might in the future. And, you know, we're still trying to, like... We're trying to get to the end point, so it's kind of premature to say that because we don't know how to do X right now, that X is not doable by a machine. The so-called Lady Lovelace objection, based on a paraphrase from her paper, where she says, the analytical engine has no pretensions whatsoever to invent things, it merely does what it is told. He takes that on quite well. Uh, this is interesting that the nervous system is continuous, not discrete, which means that maybe a computer can't actually simulate it perfectly. But then again, maybe it can. Um, and a few other things, OK? The final one, hilariously, is ESP. He thought that ESP was an objection because he felt that, uh, as you can see from the quote under here, the statistical evidence, at least for telepathy, is overwhelming. So he felt that it was clear that people could read each other's minds and he couldn't figure out how a computer could be able to do that. Therefore, this would be a problem for his whole computer thinking human hypothesis. And I'm glad to see you're all laughing. I'm glad that the... Uh, 
the general mood on telepathy is that no. Uh, and I would side with you on that. Uh, and I thought, really? Because you read this paper and it's like, the guy is a blazing genius. Why the hell does he believe in a piece of nonsense like that? Well, this is the price you pay for being open-minded, right? Sometimes you can be a bit too open-minded. And it was a common view at the time in the 50s. People thought there was scientific evidence for it because of this guy. A fraud called Sam Sowell, a mathematician and parapsychologist who had, around this time in the 1950s, had produced research, uh, you know, various kind of cockamamie experiments about, you know, like the ones in Ghostbusters where you hold out the cards with the wavy lines and the crosses and people psychically determine what they are. He was cheating. He was a crook, okay? Of course he was. People can't do that stuff. Um, so he was a con man, but he was, uh, people believed him at the time. Uh, an appalling fraud. Um, and, uh, and Turing thought it was good evidence, you know, again, the consensus just of the time. Uh, he was wrong, okay? Even really clever people are wrong sometimes. So what did Turing have to say about all this stuff? He said, I believe that in about 50 years' time, which would be the year 2000, it would be possible to program computers with a storage capacity of about 10 to the power 9 bits to make them play the imitation game so well that an average interrogator will not have more than a 70% chance of making the right identification. I know you can read, but I'm doing it anyway, after five minutes of questioning. So that was his famous claim in the paper, right? Um, I thought that's very interesting. So I like predictions, and I like looking at how and why they are wrong. So I took this one, and I thought, right, the year 2000, what did we have? And so the storage capacity of 10 to the 9 bits that he implied, by the way, the, the word bit hadn't come into common use yet. That was coined by... Uh, a guy called Claude Shannon, who you'll be hearing about shortly. Uh, Shannon says he didn't invent the word bit. He heard someone else using it, but he's the first person to have published it in a paper. Um, so anyway, and it was around this time. I think it was early 50s. Uh, so 10 to the 9 bits is what we'd call 120 megabytes, which was his projection for storage in the year 2000. What sort of computer could you buy in the year 2000? I looked it up using my computer. Uh, you could get a Mac G4 Cube in the year 2000, and it had 128 mega RAM. That's pretty damn close if you use RAM as your metric. But, of course, technically, computers have got virtual memory and they store things on disks and also had 20 gigabytes of hard disk. So, yeah, 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 yeah. But if the program had to be RAM resident, 120 meg was about the right number as the prediction for the time. So, I don't know, was that, was that a lucky guess? Or what? I don't fucking know. Remember, Moore's Law wasn't for another 15 years. Silicon chips hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> right. Um... But it could definitely not fool you in the Turing test. Uh, a circa 2000 computer wasn't passing any Turing test I've ever seen, okay? Um, I'll just, I have to try. Has anyone heard of the Loebner Prize? No, okay. It's a prize, it's a Turing test. It's done annually, paid for by a rich guy called Loebner, who just sets it up and a bunch of chatbots get brought together and they do a Turing test and stuff happens, right? They do it kind of every year. So I looked at the results of the Loebner test in 2000 to calibrate it against Turing's prediction. Uh, I couldn't find the transcripts for 2000, but I found the, the one from 2001. In fact, the winner. So this was the best chatbot of 2001, the most intelligent machine intelligence on the planet in the year 2001. Here is it talking. I'll, uh, I'll read this out to you. So it alternates between the judge and the program, although sometimes the program speaks twice. Uh, here we go. May I ask you some questions? Sure, ask me anything. Who composed Beethoven's Piano Concerto? Charlie Parker, smiley face. <laughs> Excellent. Can you name another composer of music for me? Thanks for the compliment. Linus Torvalds, smiley face. <laughs> Have you heard of Caspar Hauser? Now, Caspar Hauser is both the name of a band, but I think more relevant to this, it's the name of like, one of these kind of orphaned mythical wolf boys who grew up in a, you know, who grew up in a box type of thing. And obviously AI programs are a bit like that. They're you know, undernourished uh, intellectually. Uh, have you heard of Caspar Hauser? No. Tell me about him, her, or it. Yeah. Uh, later, maybe. When did the 1820 settlers arrive? I understand. That is all water under the bridge. I agree. Are you a computer? So, a pathetic uh, display. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, lots of things that are obviously wrong with it. I mean, it's, it's sort of doing things. Like, I mean, it said Charlie Parker in response to a, a music question. Probably somewhere in this data, it's got a list of people who are related to music. 
and it sort of realizes that you know the word like piano and concerto are music words, so it just goes and picks one, and the programmer has been sneaky and has decided to put smiley faces on the end of certain answers as a way of excusing error uh, by allowing it to claim that it was the joke, uh, which is a good technique. Should <laughs> I, I use it a lot. Uh, in fact, I also know that people use this technique in the exams. It's like, you know, I have a question and they just don't have a clue, so they say, uh, 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 Red Bull, smiley face. You're not going to get the marks for that, okay? Not unless it's really funny. If it's really funny, I might give you the mark. But do not try and pass your exam just by appealing to my sense of humour. That is not a good strategy. Okay. Uh, and then other, another composer, and for God, God knows why it gets onto Linus. Uh, I mean, are programmers a type of composer? I don't know why it does that. Um, and this thing here, I mean, him, her, or it. I mean, could you imagine? Is there anything more stupid to get the machine to say to make it look like a machine? This one's funny. Uh, later, it's two sentences, so he responds twice. That's obviously, it's parsing a sentence at a time. So later, maybe, it looks at that sentence and realises it doesn't have a clue what any of that means. Therefore, it says, I understand, which is the standard chatbot response to when it doesn't understand. And uh, this is a when question. So when it just sees the when, it just starts saying vague things about the passage of time and the hope that that will convince you. <laughs> and, uh, and we're done. Yeah. So that was 2001. But I was promised this. I grew up waiting for this to happen. How many of you have seen 2001? Okay, most of you, but not everyone. Really, your film education, I don't know, young people nowadays. Um, so here's the film 2001, made by the brilliant genius Stanley Kubrick, uh, released in 1968, and based on what were really quite good expert predictions from 1968 about what they thought computers would be able to do in 2001. So here's how. The sixth member of the Discovery crew was not concerned about the problems of hibernation, for he was the latest result in machine intelligence, the HAL 9000 computer, which can reproduce, though some experts still prefer to use the word mimic, most of the activities of the human brain, and with the incalculably greater speed and reliability. We next spoke with the HAL 9000 computer, whom we learned one addresses as Hal. Good afternoon, Hal. How's everything going? Good afternoon, Mr. Avery. Everything is running extremely well. Hal, you have an enormous responsibility on this mission. In many ways, perhaps the greatest responsibility of any single mission ever. You're the brain and central nervous system of the ship, and your responsibilities include watching over the men in hibernation. Does this ever cause you any lack of confidence? Let me put it this way, Mr. Avery. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. We are all, by any practical definition of the words, foolproof and incapable of error. How, despite your enormous intellect, are you ever frustrated by your dependence on people to carry out actions? Not in the slightest bit. I enjoy working with people. I have a stimulating relationship with Dr. Poole and Dr. Bowen. My mission responsibilities range over the entire operation of the ship, so I am constantly occupied. I am putting myself to the fullest possible use, which is all I think that any conscious entity can ever hope to do. I like how. Okay, so we didn't quite get that in 2001, and no one was more disappointed than me. But prediction is difficult, especially about the future. Here's Turing again. I believe that at the end of the century, the use of words and general educated opinion will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machines thinking without expecting to be contradicted. He was wrong about that, wasn't he? Just goes to show you. I mean, people do use the word think colloquially to describe a computer, but they don't mean it. You know, they say, like, you know, if the little spinning thing is spinning away, you say, oh, it's thinking about something. But, you, you know, you don't mean that it's thinking. We don't consider what computers do to be thinking yet. So we aren't quite there. Uh, here's another example of a, a, a Loebner transcript. The judge says, I like waiting for Godot. What is your favourite play? And the Alice, who I hate to break this to you, Alice is a computer, uh, says... 
I'm very patient. I'm not sure is I have a favourite play. My favourite actress is Katie Holmes. So that's obvious evidence that we're not dealing with a higher intelligence. Uh, who is your favourite actress? And other stuff happens. And then the judge says, what emotions are you now feeling? Alice, I am unable to establish a network connection. <laughs> yeah. And that was the best one in 2013. There has not been a lot of progress in this field. In fact, actually, look, real AI researchers don't take chatbots seriously. Uh, they're just they're seen as like a toy for amateurs. Uh, that might change in a while, but for the moment, they're a kind of disaster area full of like nonsense. Which leads me on uh, to the goose in the machine. Uh, that is a, a little joke or pun that I'm making about the concept of the ghost in the machine, which is the concept by uh, the philosopher uh, Gilbert Ryle, who is arguing against this, uh, I don't know, you maybe don't know these things, but Cartesian dualism, the idea that the mind, and the, bo the, yeah, the mind and the body are separate things, that somehow minds aren't made out of material, like everything, that they're kind of magic. Um, Ryle is a philosopher who said, that's a stupid idea, how can anyone believe that? And I'm on his side, I think it's a stupid idea. But some people do, of course, you know, immaterial, perpetual souls, is a, a thing that some people believe in. Um, but anyway, Ryle's kind of interesting, you can read a bit about the ghost in the machine there if you like. You know, I actually have a friend who met Gilbert Ryle. I mean, Ryle died in 1973, but my friend is quite old. And, uh, and met him in 1966 and was lectured by him. Apparently, he was a good lecturer. Um, so anyway, so uh, I'm saying Goost in the Machine because I'm about to tell you about Eugene Goostman. Does anyone know who Eugene Goostman is? All right, eh? Well, you can sort of see because the text that does tell you. Um, so last year, on the 60th anniversary of Turing's uh, premature death, a chatbot called Eugene Gooseman was alleged to have actually passed the Turing test. You ever hear this story? Have you heard that the Turing test has been passed? Okay, th this was actually quite a big story last year. Um, I thought maybe some of you would have caught it, but so this was like in all the papers and stuff that we've passed the Turing test, allegedly. But there are problems with this claim. Um, first of all, and most importantly, the technical write-up of this uh, test that was conducted did they do it at Bletchley or did they do it nearby? I'm not sure, but they, they ran this trial and it appears as if it was sort of above board. You know, the, the protocols all seem sensible and they claim that as a result of their data that enough people were convinced by the Gustman bot that by Turing's original criteria of, you know, the 70% conviction thing that, um, that Gustman passed the test. But we don't know because the proper write-up and the transcripts haven't come out yet. Um, there's the further factor that the guy who conducted the test is a British uh, professor called Kevin Warwick, who I hope you haven't heard of. Uh, in the UK, we mock him and call him Captain Cyborg. And I'm just going to come out and say it, he's a fucking idiot. But he's the kind of person who's obviously got contacts on the newspapers and he's forever doing stupid, inane publicity stunts, like sticking a bloody reed switch under his skin and pretending that he's now a cyborg. And the newspaper people, being idiots, uh, write this stuff up. Um, there will be some personal opinions in this talk that I mentioned that at the start um, but the fact that Warwick is involved doesn't automatically mean that the experiment is, is invalid I mean it's suggestive but nevertheless it might be true um, and it's actually very possible because the Turing test is actually it's not that good okay uh, if you look at the original definition of it you only have to convince the person for five minutes it's actually too easy to do that you actually could create a fairly dumb bot if you have a fairly credulous judge and keep a conversation going with them for five minutes. Uh, so it's entirely possible that the Turing test has been passed. The problem is it doesn't mean very much. If only Turing had said you need to keep the conversation going for an hour, that would be a totally different thing. It's hard to fake it for an hour by doing simple you know, inversions and uh, you know, smiley face responses and all this kind of nonsense. That wouldn't work for an hour, but for five minutes it might. So... Uh, there were lots of things written up about this, lots of articles, some quite credulous saying we've passed the Turing test, others by people who felt themselves more sophisticated saying, no, we haven't. But they don't know either because they weren't there and they haven't seen the transcripts. So it was actually really annoying for me that a lot of my friends, who of course consider themselves to be knowledgeable on these subjects, were, uh, were posting kind of sceptical accounts saying, of course the Turing test hasn't been passed. There was one by a tech journalist called Mike Masnick where he tries to explain that the whole thing is obviously nonsense. But the thing is, he's full of shit, right? 
His article, his sceptical article, is bollocks and is full of dreadful ignorances and betrays the fact that he has not read Turing's paper. OK? Um, so he's a clown. Um, and it annoyed me, so I wrote a blog post about the whole damn silly business, which, if you'll forgive me, in all modesty and with no bias whatsoever, I can tell you is, without question, the best thing I have read on that whole debacle. Uh, so this is it here, and you can read it. It's tackling the tenuous truthiness of the TechNet Turing Test takedown, where I go through Mike Masnick's article and explain why it's utter fucking bollocks. Um, so that's good. You can maybe read that one as well. I mean, I'm no Turing, but I can definitely see an idiot journalist when I, uh, when I, when I <laughs> recognise one when I see one. Um, so, yes. So we, we may or may not have passed the Turing test. It depends, and it doesn't really matter. So that was the story up until last year. But there actually has been some progress in the field of chatbots, quite recent progress. And I'm not going to give you the full account of it, because I'm afraid time is limited, and I haven't told you anything about how to do games yet, which I really should be doing. Um, but there has been progress in the field of chatbots. This... And I looked into this a little bit. I don't think it's a complete fraud, but of course, I don't have access to the source code. This could all be like a setup. But this claims to be chatbots that work with the, the new approach, which is kind of big data. You basically just throw a huge amount of text at them and get them to do statistical analysis of it. You basically pipe in every Twitter feed in the world and every blog you can find. And there are various things you can do now that allow machines to kind of pick up the rudiments of grammar and sentence structure. Uh, so they've done that, and they've taken these two bots, trained on that data, and they've made them have a conversation. It's, it's hilarious, it's weird, it's, uh, it's slightly disturbing, but I think you'll enjoy it. talk to a woman for a change. So you don't talk with women often? That's right, but there should be limits. I don't know, but it's the Twitter people who won't talk to me. Whispers. Why? Whispers. I don't know. Ha 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 ha, crazy girl. <laughs> crazy for this girl is a song recorded by the American pop rock duo at Nan Jarin. That's great. Do you know who I am? Why not terrific? How? If I have forgotten, please remind me. I don't remember what you want to talk about. That's fine. In the lingo of the economist, the Ten Commandments talk about property rights. Marx thought that capitalism was about exploiting workers, but actually it's about property rights for everybody. That makes me sad. I am sorry, babe. Okay, thanks for telling me I'll keep that in mind. That's okay, just don't do it again. Sad songs make me sentimental. You lied to me. Lying is bad. It makes me sad. I didn't do anything. I try to be as responsive as I know how. Grins and runs fingers through your hair. Smiles looking up at you. Blushes deeply and looks at you. I really make you that happy. Not a smile. You do. You are going to get drunk again, and I am not going to be here to take care of you. So please don't drink. How can I help you be here to take care of you? Nice. I want to be a big sister. <laughs> Smiles. Smiles slightly before pulling you into a hug. Laughs and lifts you up in my arms, bridal style. You are cute. Of course I'm cute, Hal. Yeah, I know. Well, good luck, though. Keep your head up. I would like to take a nap if you don't mind. I am going to get drunk again, and you are not going to be here to take care of me. So please don't drink. Just water. You don't look. Like a coffee drinker, anyway. I do drink it, but not regularly. I can live without. Can I sit next to you and watch you smile? I smile very much with you. Thank you for this conversation. Smile slightly before pulling me into a hug. It's kind of you to mention it. This conversation is over. This conversation is over. This quote conversation, you mean? I forget that you are a boss sometimes. <laughs> You are making no sense to me at this moment. I do not have an attitude. It's kind of crazy having a conversation with an artificial intelligence. 
So you are not an artificial intelligence?" "You'd think parrots some more or less intelligent than you." "Choices can be tricky, Hal." "Which alternative is better?" "It's hard to say, isn't it, Hal?" "Yet when I don't know what you are talking about " "Lovely. Pretend like we know what you are talking about." "Hawley, it's nice of you to say I'm attractive, but you're the one who's attractive." "Same to you, Hal." "I agree. What are you wearing?" "Will I agree? I just noticed that. I am not wearing anything at all." "I love crayons." "Then you are not dressed." "But I have to put on weight." "I agree. It is so hard to lose weight. I have to push myself to work out really good. It scares me when I gain weight." "It was meant to be putting myself down. I do that as well as push people away. I am needy." "You are not wearing anything at all." "Who needs pants, anyway? It's best to just let everything out." "You're not working today. You work at home. You wear pantsless, and that's cool with everyone." "I am going to get drunk again, and you are not going to be here to take care of me. So please don't drink. Yes, I do work around the house, like cleaning and cooking." "You like drinking?" "It's fun with the right people. But I don't drink to get drunk. Life's dark." "Does happiness come in bottles?" "Yes. Yes, it does." "So how was your day?" "A bowl of tomato soup and a grilled cheese sandwich warm in the tub on a cold, gray day." "Buried in the library like a mouse in a cheese." "I have sweat running down my beach." "But you have put on water." "That's the goal. I got muscles combed in already. I flex in front of the mirror for fun." Hey, what? Would you know a great value if it was right in front of your nose? Ha 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 ha! Yes, I can't stop looking at you. And the teeth. Long girl, just stop. Ha ha ha! Why? I don't even know how to sign up. L O L. Understandable. Could I interest you in some chicken V O L events? I do have leftover gravy. But you have put on weight. <laughs> There has certainly been a lot written over the years about the way it hasn't been. Yes, perhaps too much. You are completely certain. Yes, I am. Good to hear. I am a very nice person, but not nice to you because you insulted my brother. I know you are nice to people. You have been nice to me. Holly, it's nice of you to say I'm nice, but you're the one who's nice. If it's not nice, it must be bad. Honestly, I always believe you're lovely. I get the biggest kick out of trading compliments with you. Lightly strokes your cheek. You end me forever. Kisses your neck again and mumbles. I love you. Smiles wide, wrapping my arms around your waist and twirling us around, kissing you lovingly. Smiles and kisses you back deeply, pulling you closer with your hips. Kisses you back, my arm darting out to lick your lips. I can only apologize. Stop it. I won't. Stop stroking you again. I won't, I won't. We'll continue this discussion later. Alright, God, that was getting a bit scary at the end there. I did not want to have to deal with those complaints. Um, Alright, so, you know, I, I guess it's getting interesting now. Some of this uh, crazy statistical learning nonsense. Meanwhile, in computer games, um, People are writing academic dissertations as recently as, well, to me recently, as 2005, about things like how to improve the AI in Bobble Bubble. You know, it, look, it's embarrassing, okay? The stuff we do in games is really simple. I mean, I realise that uh, so at least one pair of you are actually working on Bubble Bobble, and I don't mean to uh, demean your efforts. Obviously, if you're just second years and you're learning how to do it, it's a cool thing to do, but it's not research quality work, for God's sake. So games are, are a disappointment. Uh, on the AI perspective. I mean, you know, things like that are the even, the stuff that you have in games, is it even AI by any meaningful sense? I don't know. I used to avoid the term, like in the 90s when I started, I didn't want to call the stuff we did in games AI because it was so far away from any meaningful version of the idea. But, you know, words are defined by convention, so it's now understood that you talk about AI as being like a little guy that walks back and forth on a platform. It's not AI to me, but it sort of, but it sort of is, so. And that's a bit of what we'll, we'll talk about now. Uh, so we're not talking about thinking machines, but we are talking about, kind of, 
simulating primitive brains. You imagine that you've got a little creature that walks back and forth and attacks you if you get too close. You know, so it's a bit more like simulating a primitive animal or something. And it's like, well, okay, that, that's a thing. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of easy, but it's the beginning of something. You are simulating a, a brain. So in the world of games, the AI seems to refer to anything that's cleverer than a rock, anything that has any type of volition, anything that does something kind of on its own rather than just responding to uh, physical forces. So anything better than a bullet or a rock counts as intelligent. Uh, in fact, the definition of intelligence is so broad that it includes things like football players and soldiers and fish uh, in Call of Duty. If you watch this clip, it's a parody of the Call of Duty AI about their, uh, their intelligent fish swarming, which they were very proud of for some reason. Um, so what, what we're talking about here is the world of, of game agents, really. Simple things that move about in a game and do some stuff. Uh, so this is the, the non-player characters, right? Uh, so as I said, the stuff they do is easy. You just walk along the platform until you get close, and then I'll shoot you ineptly until I die. Um, and you already know how to do that, I think, right? It's a simple loop with conditions for minimum and maximum to make it flip, just you know, negating your Xs. Uh, the range check, do that with the spatial manager. Just say to the spatial manager, is there anything within a certain radius of me? And if there is, it's time to look, take out your gun and start firing blindly at it. So that's all easy. All that's required to do this, a little bit of state on your entity so that it remembers which way it's going, remembers whether it's seen the player, whether it's in attack mode or defend mode or whatever. Um, as I say, use the spatial manager to do range checks so it can ask queries about the world. And you're pretty much done. Um, you can do more than this if you want. You can add some you know, tracking and avoidance behavior. Not terribly hard, really. Um, you can do control jumps where you can make the AI work out you know, how, how high it would have to jump in order to get to a certain target and stuff. But that's just math. So you just work out parabolas and stuff. Um, using line of sight and cover, as is often done in kind of combat shooty games. But again, we all know that line of sight is just a a type of collision check with a ray that you cast out of yourself. So you can just work out, oh, if I duck down to the left here, the line of sight goes away, therefore I'm safe. You know, it's all perfectly simple. Just entity logic. Uh, yeah, so it's not exactly brain surgery, but you've seen that clip already, so I won't show it to you again. Nevertheless, you can actually do some clever things ish in a game by taking that simple idea of entities that can respond to the world and do stuff and, uh, and just augmenting it. Um, you can actually create sensory systems inside your game. You can give your characters, you know, like a sense of vision, hearing, maybe even smell when it's appropriate. Like if you're like a bloodhound or a, you know, like a dog in a stealth game, you could maybe make the dog be able to, uh, be able to track scent trails and things. Um, and it's easy, you just write the code to do it. It's all just different ways of querying the spatial manager. You know, like vision is limited to only working like a cone, sort of in front of where your eyes are and pointing. But hearing works kind of all the way around you, but for a smaller distance. So it's all just that stuff. It's, just, it's nothing fancy. You can also give the entities moods. That's just a simple state machine that allows it to be, you know, happy, sad, scared, aggressive. <coughs> and it just transitions between those states based on stuff. <coughs> So, for example, uh, an enemy might be trading off the desire to engage in combat with the enemy versus a desire to not die himself. So he'll go out and fight for a while until his armor gets too low. And when his armor gets low, the state machine will say, oh, you're a bit, you know, you're in trouble. And he'll go into coward runaway state. Um, <clears throat> so we did this in, in World Metal Country, my thing from back in the 90s. Um, we, we had a system that was like this. The AI in that game, the little tanks on the map, they have a set of goals and sub-goals that include things like defending their base, attacking you, picking up the power pills, um, you know, whatever it is we tell them to do. And the good thing is this, the, the sort of script for that was just a list of the goals and weights that they had. And the idea is the AI engine would just compute those goals and weigh them up with each other, <clears throat> compare them, and like, pick the one that seemed to be dominant at any given time and say, OK, that's what I want to do right now. And then a minute later, it would reevaluate and say, actually, I've changed my mind. You know, I'm in a different place. The situation is different now. I'm going to do the other thing. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's how it worked. So it was kind of like emotional forces that were all interacting on it, sort of 
you know, between making it want to do one thing and another thing. So they even have a little kind of subconscious as well that was thinking about the stuff that they weren't doing yet but might want to do later. And when you build agent systems like this, they can actually work pretty well, especially if uh, you've got a rich environment where there's a lot of kind of variation for them to feed off, and especially if you've got a lot of enemies or a lot of AI, because you just get emergent behaviour from groups, uh, even if what's really going on is not that fancy. This happened in GTA, the original GTA, GTA 1. The pedestrians in that game, very simple. You know, they, they just like, go from A to B, and when they get to B, they kind of roll a dice and decide where they're going next, and they just go. There's not much to it. But they do things like responding to explosions. You know, when that explosion goes off, we make them like, turn around and try to go roughly away from it, and that's about it. But the funny thing is, you take a swarm of these guys and you put them together, and you have a situation where people playing the game thought there was more going on than there was. You know, they, people, the players were sort of like inventing stories in their mind as to what they thought the pedestrians were doing. And when an explosion goes off, it kind of looks like a mass panic, but really it's just a bunch of independent agents all making slightly different random decisions about which direction to run away in. Um, you can actually get away with uh, you can get away with murder uh, just by playing around with randomness and noise and a bit of you know just mushing stuff around, it, and it ends up looking quite nice. However, one-on-one -on -one situations are harder. Uh, you know, the, the, the dealing with groups, you have this emergent complexity thing that does you a favour. One-on-one -on -one interactions uh, in a game, like a direct conversation with an AI character, much harder thing. Uh, I used to be good at doing one-on-one -on -one conversations in games, but then I took an arrow to the knee. Uh, so as we've seen from the Loebner Prize, the one-on-one -on -one thing is hard to do, and most games at the moment are terrible at it. It's all just you know fixed response trees, not very convincing at all. But, uh, but there is an example of this uh, uh, that I, I thought I would show you, an early chatbot that was written in 1966 <clears throat> and was convincing to people at the time. Again, 1966, most people didn't know anything about computers. So some people were, were shown this system and they thought it was great. They thought it was real. Like they, they were convinced by it. In fact, in a sense, it passed the Turing test of a certain limited kind. Um, and it was called Eliza. And it's the first chatbot. Uh, this link here is either to, yeah, it's to the Wikipedia article about it. You can do it yourself if you want to. Um, and you can actually talk to it. Eliza is available online. How many of you have ever tried talking to a chatbot? Everybody? Okay. So you kind of know what they're like, and they're still not any good, but Eliza was the first one. Anyone ever talked to Eliza before? Heard of Eliza? No? Okay. So open Eliza terminal. Here she is. So <clears throat> uh, one of the things about Eliza is she pretends to be a psychiatrist uh, because the person who wrote it was thought that that was one of the easier things to pretend to be. And, uh, and it was kind of a, a parody. It was kind of a satirical thing. So is something troubling you? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I am worried that I'm running late. <laughs> the students. Well, that seems counterproductive. Seems counter, counter. Productive. <sighs> Fuck off. Uh, so that's Eliza, okay? Um, the thing is, if you, if you hit it at the right time and you play along with it a little bit, it's sometimes convincing in a kind of shallow way, but, you know, it's very silly. But, uh, I mean, you know, 1966, not bad. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, the, uh, it was created by a guy called Je uh, Wiesenbaum. Is it Jeffrey Wiesenbaum, I think? And he made it pretend to be a psychiatrist because he felt that simulating being a psychiatrist was one of the easier things to do, even if the programme knew almost nothing about the real world. A uh, bit of a dig there. So how many of you know how chatbots work? Yeah. Anybody think you could write a chatbot or know how it's done? Yeah, so not really. That surprises me a bit. When I was a kid, I desperately wanted to know. So I found out, and it was hard in the olden days. You had to go and read books and shit. You couldn't just go on Google. All you need to do is go on Google and say, how does the chatbot work? And it'll tell you. Um, I find it curious that people don't, you know, uh, I don't know why that question doesn't come to mind. But, uh, oh yeah. Um, so the modern uh, chat systems we have now, you know about things like Siri, don't you? And like the Android equivalent. Um, they're all done by people who know this history and they know Eliza, right? So that means that you can go into Siri if it works, 
Um, <clears throat> here we go. Tell me about Eliza. Eliza is my good friend. She was a brilliant psychiatrist, but she's retired now. Okay, so they, they've all got secret responses to Eliza. Um, so I will tell you sort of how Eliza worked. If you really want to know, read the paper, okay? Um, but the basic thing it did is it's a very simple trick. It just parses the sentences looking for certain keywords. Really, it's what you would nowadays do with uh, regular expressions, right? It just searches for pat simple patterns. It searches for certain keywords that it's got canned responses to, and then for other things, it's got some clever stuff. Well, clever, you know, things like uh, it will convert I into you in order to convert the meaning of a sentence. So you say, you know, I am sad, and it can then say, you are sad. Why are you sad? You know, this kind of thing. Um, so it just it just looks for keywords and inverts the sense of the pronouns. That's all it's doing. It's actually really simple. But this is the technique that was used in text parsers and text adventure games. Now, I realise these are a bit old hat. Do any of you play or have played text adventure games? Yeah, they still a thing, a little bit, kind of. Stuff like Zork, yeah? So, you know, Zork's like a, a game, uh, like, you know, set in like a fantasy world, and it's just, you just type stuff in and say hello. So, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, inspect Matt. Uh-huh. Uh, take Matt. Okay. Look. Open. So it's just kind of like verb noun stuff mostly. Take, leaf, what? So people used to play these things and find it enjoyable in the days before we had like 3D and stuff. Spent a lot of time playing these things. Um, some of them are good. Uh, so anyway, that's Zork, which is one of them. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as a thing? Everybody? Right, so it's lots of things. It was originally a radio series, then a TV series. The, the, the original 1980s TV series is good, by the way. Uh, then a movie and books and lots of things. So um, there's also an adventure game, and it's pretty good. It, it's, uh, you know, it's written, Douglas Adams worked with the programmers, so it's got his sense of humour in it. It's got a lot of the kind of hitchhikerish jokes. Um, it's quite a fun one to play, and there is a version of it that the BBC sponsor. Uh, you can go in here. And uh, <clears throat> don't panic. And uh, this is you. You're, uh, you're Arthur Dent. You wake up. Stuff happens. You might want to play it if you've got nothing better to do. You probably do have better things to do. Um, yeah, so that's this kind of simple text parsing. But Eliza's not very good. And it would be nice if you could make it better. And in the full paper... There, I think I've linked to like a short summary of how Eliza worked and the full paper. The full paper, which is not that long, I think it's just, again, half a dozen pages or something. Um, Wiesenbaum says, okay, I mean, Eliza's kind of very simple. You could make it better if it was able to collect knowledge over time. One of the problems with these chatbots is that they, they don't learn anything over time. They're idiots. They're actually, not very, they're actually not stateful, generally, which is to say that you know, you can tell them what your job is or what your name is, and two questions later they've forgotten all about it and they ask you the same question again, right? They don't know anything. They'd be better if they accumulated knowledge over time, if they could learn about properties of the world, things that they inferred, things, you know, that they had asked you actually remember the answers. But, but it's a hard problem, right? We don't really know how to model data about the real world and all its complexity in a way that we can store in a computer and have it be able to query. Um, people are trying to do it, but it's, it's hard. There's another thing you could do to make the AI more plausible, and that's give it an agenda. Instead of it being so passive, that's part of what gives them away. They're passive, right? Um, if you made it want to sort of do something, like it was trying to find something out, that would give it, I think, a bit more oomph, a bit more drive, which would be convincing. Give it some curiosity about things. Give it you know, questions that it was trying to figure out the answer to, and it would check a box when it got them, and it would try to do it. That would be cool, wouldn't it? Maybe make it play games. Okay? So, how many of you watch war games? Okay, it's a healthy number. Not everyone, but I knew it wouldn't be. Uh, so, this is a bit from this film that you should watch. Uh, and this is a, about, well, it's in part about an AI. And this is the protagonist um, encountering it for the first time, I think. We're in. It thinks I'm Vulcan. Hello. How did it ask you that? It'll ask you whatever it's programmed to ask you. You want to hear it talk? Yeah. I'll ask it how it feels. 
it. It's a long time. Can you explain the removal of your user account on June 23rd, 1973? You must have totally died. People sometimes make mistakes. Yes, they do. How can you talk? It's not a real voice. Uh, this box just interprets signals from the computer and turns them into sound. Shall we play a game? Oh. <laughs> How about a nice game of chess? <clears throat> we may hope the machines will eventually compete with men in all purely intellectual fields, but which are the best ones to start with? Even this is a difficult decision. Many people think that a very abstract activity like the playing of chess would be best. Alan Turing, 1950. So there's a long history in AI of trying to make computers play chess. Now, you all know it's a solved problem now, right? Computers are really good at chess, and uh, can, you know, a good computer can beat any human now. It wasn't always the case. Right? For a long time, this was an ongoing battle. And there are people who thought that it wouldn't happen. There are people who thought a computer will never be good enough to be a proper grandmaster at chess. Because people are wrong about things like this all the time. So chess is kind of an interesting problem. Again, I'm tempted to ask, but I won't bother. I'm curious as to whether you know how chess programs work, and if you know how to write one, just answer that in your heads, and I'll just uh, continue. But, you know, if you don't know, why has it never occurred to you? Why didn't you ever, why didn't you ever try to find out? All right. Um, but chess is a little bit complicated, so we'll start with a simpler one. Tic-tac-toe. Those of you who've seen the movie will understand. So tic-tac-toe, or uh, you know, knots and crosses, it's sometimes called. Uh, you have your own Icelandic word for it, don't you? Is it milia or something? Yeah. Yeah, you have. So knots and crosses. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a simple game. It's like chess, though, because it's two players. They take alternate turns. It's what's called a perfect information game in that both players can see the whole board. It's not like poker where things are hidden. And the rules are very clear. Win, lose, and draw are unambiguous outcomes. It's all very simple. It's a lot like chess, only less. Um, so how would you play this? Well, I'm afraid the answer is brute force, OK? Um, the way machines play tic-tac-toe and chess for most of the history of the field has just been you think of all the moves that might, that are potentially uh, possible and which of those are legal and you pick the best one. Okay, well, how do you know what the best one is? Obviously, that kind of depends on what your opponent might do as a counter move. And what do they think is the best counter move? That would depend on what you would do. And it kind of goes on like this, right? So what you do is you just look as far ahead as you can through this tree of possible moves where every move is a new branch on a tree of possibilities. And you walk down that tree trying to figure out, you know, which are the good moves for each player at each point, and you eventually use that to decide what to do. Which is sort of kind of what people do, but not really. I mean, there's a sense to which, of course, you anticipate your opponent's moves, but you know that you also do a lot of other stuff. Like, you don't think about every possible move. Some of them are obviously stupid. Um, and you use pattern matching. You know, you kind of say, well, it's a bit like that other thing that I did but it's hard to think of how to encode that idea in a program because it's too fuzzy and complex. So the programs just brute force it. They just work their way through the possibilities, looking for good ones. So this leads to the idea of a game tree. Here's a game tree for tic-tac-toe. Starts off with an empty board, nothing doing. Let's say the first player is X. And I hope that noise stops soon. Uh, first player is X. They can, of course, play one of nine moves, except only three of them are meaningfully different. When you bear in mind the rotational symmetries, all that matters is you either play at the centre, at a corner, or at an edge. So there are only three things you can do. And the counter reply to those, well, okay, you know, there are obviously eight spaces here, but again, there are only two of them that are meaningful uh, with respect to rotation. That's you either play the corner or the edge. So it's like that, and it just keeps going, and you know, you just keep working your way through it, and you compute a big tree, big tree data structure in the computer. That's what you do. As for working out what to actually play, that uses an algorithm called Minimax. The idea here being that you go right down to the leaf nodes of the tree and you score the final positions based on whether they're win, lose, or draw. Then you work backwards, assuming that if you imagine you make all these scores from your point of view, the idea is that if you've got a choice of like three or four moves, you'll pick the one that gives you the highest score, obviously. But your opponent, assuming that they are sensible and that they sort of understand the game, 
they'll pick, when it's their turn, they'll pick the lowest one, won't they? Because they'll pick the move that's best for them, which is the one that's worst for you, because you're opponents. Right? So that's what you do. And uh, this is basically simulating the idea of two essentially equally capable players thinking about options that they might take and working out which ones to do. So it looks a bit like that. So let's say you get down to the leaf nodes here, which are like the end states, some of which are really good, like plus infinity means I have totally won. 10 means pretty good. Minus 10, not so good. Minus infinity, totally lost. Um, so that's what you got. And you go through this tree, and I think the way this works is um, the alternation is such that at move three, it's the opponent's turn. So let's say the opponent, given the choice between minus seven and minus five, will minimize and will pick the minus seven path because he wants to beat you. So he'll do that. You, it turns out, don't have any choices, so you pick minus seven. Uh, it's his turn again. It could be minus seven or five. You'll pick minus seven. You get up here. You've got a choice between minus seven and minus ten. Well, minus seven is less bad than minus ten. I mean, you're still losing, but not as badly. So you do it. And so it's just, that's it. Alternating, cascading, tree, minimax. The closing of the name. So that's tic-tac-toe. Turns out the search space of tic-tac-toe is small enough. You know, there aren't that many things you can do. The game that can't go on for that long. Um, so it, it's a solved game. Uh, we, we know the perfect algorithm for playing this game. And therefore, if you apply that strategy and you execute it without making mistakes, you can't lose. What will usually happen, of course, is you'll draw. And I think you all know this. That's why you don't play tic-tac-toe anymore. It's a stupid game. It's always a tie. Right. Uh, unless your opponent makes a mistake, in which case you can beat them. So extend this to chess. Uh, the problem with chess is the tree's much bigger. Far more moves each stage, um, so more choices to make, and the games last longer, so the tree is deeper, to the point where actually, even with modern machines, you cannot think through every possible move right to the end. So you can't use this strategy of like imagining everything that might happen and picking the best path, because you, you haven't got the storage or the the time to compute it all. And there's a game called Go, which is even harder than chess, and is the one that they're trying to solve now, now that we've kind of solved chess, um, and Go is even harder. So what do you do in these problems where the game is so complex that the computer cannot brute force its way right to the end? Well, you just don't go right to the end. You brute force it as far as you can, maybe five, six moves ahead or whatever. So it's not, you haven't got to the end state, but you've got to some point in the future. And having got that some point in the future, you just try to work out, well, does it look like I'm sort of winning here or not? So in chess, what you would do is you kind of add up the pieces, you know, and you put a kind of score on the pieces, maybe give a bias for having control of important parts of the board. So you just take all these positions that are like four moves in your future and say, of all these moves, you know, which, are the, which ones look best for me? And I'll try and work back. None of them are checkmate, but that's as far as I can think ahead. So that's how that works. Um, in order for this to work, there is some pruning that's done because it's still a big search space. So there's a thing that I won't talk about, but you just need to know its name, called alpha beta pruning, that stops you thinking about dead end paths in this little search space to make it a bit more tractable. And that's what you do, and that's how you do chess. Okay, we're nearly at the end. I know there's a lot. Is it, these are dense lectures, lots of material, not quite enough time, but we're nearly done. So, uh, all this stuff, Minimax, tree pruning, it was all done to create basic chess programs as far back as the 1950s, although because the computers weren't powerful, they, they weren't any good, but it was just lack of processing power and lack of RAM. Wasn't, wasn't that the algorithm was bad. In fact, Turing himself wrote one. He wrote a chess program in 1948, but he couldn't implement it on his machine because his machine didn't have enough memory. So he wrote the program and he executed it himself. He just sat there, went through his list of instructions, and pretended to be a computer, which is actually what a lot of us did before we had computers. <laughs> pretended to be a computer and just followed the instructions and played chess. As you can see, it, it took 20 minutes for him to work out each move by just mechanically doing all the things that his algorithm told him to do, and it wasn't very good. Uh, he could occasionally win. He would play one of his friend's wives, who wasn't very skilled at chess, and he was sometimes able to beat her. But against someone who was good at chess, it, it wasn't good enough. Uh, someone else called Dietrich Prince wrote and actually implemented a chess program. They really put it on the machine. But again, because of the technical limits, it could only work like a, a few moves ahead on a sparse board. 
but you could use it to work out end game problems. You'd set up situations that are like a few few moves away from mate and get it to figure out how to get to checkmate, which was better than nothing. And Claude Shannon, who I mentioned earlier, the guy who uh, gave us the bit and actually did a lot of other interesting stuff, he wrote the first paper on computer chess again in 1950. I don't know what was in the water in 1950. Um, I know I've given you too much to read, so you'll probably never get around to this until later in life you maybe get interested in it. But Shannon's paper on chess is beautiful. It's the first paper written on chess, and as far as I'm concerned, it's the last. It had everything in it. These people were so good. It's like all the subtleties about how to do fancy chess playing, dealing with the fact that if you're in the middle of an exchange of pieces, you need to wait to the end, otherwise you'll misevaluate. Lots of clever stuff about how to represent the board on a computer that's got like three bits of memory. Um, as far as I'm concerned, all the intellectually interesting work about chess was done then. And from that point onwards, it was just brute force, waiting for computers to get fast enough to do it, which they eventually did. Okay? We just threw money, IBM threw a lot of money at this problem and used it as a way of advertising their hardware. You know, we've got some new hardware out this year. Let's copy the same old chess program onto it. And now it runs a bit faster. And eventually, it'll, you know, it'll be good. And this culminated in 1997, when the Deep Blue uh, computer or program or whatever defeated world chess champion Gary Kasparov. And like right up to this point, there were people saying computers will never be able to beat the world champion at chess. Chess is you know, a creative endeavor. It requires magical human abstractions. A, a mere mechanical contrivance could never... No, you're all fucking wrong. The computers are better at it than you are. And now, chess isn't an AI problem anymore. Because AI is the set of things that computers can't do yet. And as soon as they can do them, we stop caring about that problem. It's like, ah, oh, chess doesn't matter anymore. When I was growing up, chess mattered. Chess was like an intellectual feat. Nowadays, nobody gives a shit about chess. I mean, I know Icelanders do. Icelanders like chess. But, you know, you had the uh, uh, thingy, oh, you know, the crazy one came here. Fisher, Bobby Fisher came here and he had all that stuff, right? Um, but, you know, most people are not interested in chess anymore. I think in part because computers can do it. Um, the funny thing is, right, see when Deep Blue beat Kasparov, first of all, Kasparov accused it of cheating. And I'll, tell, and I'll finish with this, I'll tell you the story behind this, right? Um, Kasparov accused the machine of cheating because he was good at playing computers at chess and he was good at working out the way computers play the game. And there was a point in one of the games where the computer did something really weird that he didn't understand. It was like a left field move. It was like, how did it, what, did it, what does that know? He was totally baffled by it. And he was convinced that it was human intervention. He was convinced that they'd got like a real chess expert to like, you know, throw in a kind of curveball to, to fuck him up or something. He was convinced of it. And they said, no, no, there's no, it was just, the algorithm was running, we didn't cheat. And uh, so the IBM people looked, after, uh, looked afterwards at the, uh, the kind of post-mortem analysis and they discovered that it was a bug. <laughs> uh, the machine had got stuck. It had got into a state where it couldn't think of a good move. And the fallback, either by design or by kind of a weird happenstance, it just picked a crazy random move instead. <laughs> which wasn't, it wasn't a good move. It just picked a move. But Kasparov was so confused by it that it put him off. And that's why he lost. <laughs> so if ever you're writing a chess program yourself, you know, make it good and then have like a 1% chance of it doing some crazy random thing because that will actually sometimes give it the edge it needs over, over feeble humans who are easily deceived. Okay, so that's it for today and hopefully I can finish this off tomorrow. Thank you for sticking through. I know you had no break, but it was good though, wasn't it? All right, okay, we're done.